Hi everyone, welcome to week three. Um, today we're going to, we're following uh, with a more specific example, a set of examples really, uh, from the theoretical overview uh, that I gave in week two, in which we were thinking about how common sense can be constructed through what I call uh, the language of Hollywood and specifically how ideas and ideology are passed as normative through these languages and how these filmic languages, mainstream fil filmic languages, not just simply reflect what is in there, but actually constructs what is in there. Um, so this is extremely important because in the end, what film does, film uh, is important in this class, not on, not just simply as film, but as an entry point to how different stories create history, um, i.e. how visual discourses are able to create and construct political discourses. Because really politics, a lot of, a great deal in politics, not all politics, but, um, the, the base of politics is inserting a narrative, whatever it is, into the public domain. And in that, in that way, and, and I'm thinking here narrative at the most basic level, not just a political narr narrative of spin uh, when it comes to, or even framing when it comes to politics. I'm thinking uh, ideas, a language really, a grammar, uh, uh, of an idea at the mo at the most basic level, and I think the revolutionary, and I've chosen the, re the I've chosen the revolutionary, because it it allows us to understand this visual discourse at the most basic level. Now, just pause for a moment and picture the image of a radical the, of the revolution or a revolutionary, right? If you pause for a moment and close your eyes and think about that image. Likely that image will be that of a male figure. That figure will be completely outside of government. Um, and it will, has to do something with uh, marginal politics. Um, and that idea that we have of a revolutionary and radical outside of government as a male figure, it's a, it's an, it's a mental image that is constructed through visual culture. And then politics reappropriate that figure. And it does it mostly unconsciously. So there is no malice really. It's not a reappropriation uh, uh, in which a scheming of some kind is involved. It does it and then creates a political discourse. So for instance, you can picture Lenin or Che Guevara more easily, probably, but you don't know Rosa Luxemburg, the image of Rosa Luxemburg. If you think about true radical, then, oh, oh, you know, uh, this idea of a revolutionary, you think of Che Guevara, you don't think of Rosa Luxemburg, which is there in the middle of the screen to your right. Um, you don't think of Emma Goldman, the anarchist Emma Goldman uh, in, the early, in the early 10s, 1910s, uh, there at the bottom. Um, but you understand, you think about Martin Luther King and then you, you, you have the image of Mama Connex and you may know Rosa Parks, but you don't have the mental image of Rosa Parks already available. You probably have to search for it. If I, if I say Rosa Parks, it doesn't really, an image doesn't really come to mind. Maybe an idea, maybe the name is understood. Uh, but not much else, right? And here is Rosa Park, the top corner on the right. Um, so that little example uh, is telling you when we think of revolutionaries within Martin Luther King, within Malcolm X, we think Lenin, we think Che Guevara, we don't think these other people that were also very important revolutionaries, if you look at the nitty gritty of history, very important revolutionaries uh, when it comes to uh, advancing different types of political movements. 
And that there is there is a reason behind that, because that idea of the male revolutionary outside of politics, it is some it, it's something constructed within mainstream politics. And visual culture has created and reinforced that picture. It creates the story of the of the of the outcast, of the marginal who tries to push his government as the radical, not as some not as someone who is in the government, as a radical. And if you think any any uh, you know president of of a Western nation, and think about declaration of wars, couldn't be something more radical than a declaration of war, that sending your own country to war for a political purpose. But we don't think of that as radical. We think of a demonstration of rhetoric, of a fire speech as radical. And not only that, we think that as radical in the way that was presented by Malcolm X, by Martin Luther King, by Lenin, by Che Guevara. So these other figures are not ready available for us. We don't know Rosa Luxemburg. We don't know what she stands for. We don't have her image available. We don't have that entry point. And what this means is that you don't have the entry point available for you, right? Um, and I end with it's a very simple, maybe it's a silly example, but it's again, we're talking here about the entry points, um, and which and entry points are really important, even though they might not be substantial. The idea that you have an image, an image of a revolutionary as a male figure like Che Guevara is not substantial uh, in and of itself, but it is important in the sense that that's your entry point to understand radical politics, for instance, and you don't understand radical politics. And, and there is a lot of implications uh, about that. And so I am, this 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 part of the lecture with this with this other example, uh, which is which is this entry points allows us to create political discourses of what's radical, who's radical, and who's what's not, and who's not radical. So the Greens can be uh, very easily labeled as radical without batting an eye, without even having to look at their policy. And again, here I'm not saying that the Green are or aren't radical. It is just when you think when that word comes out in a political speech, there's very little that anyone has to do to, for you to understand that the Greens are radicals and that labor is a more sensible, moderate, reformist, center leftist. And it might be true that those two policies, that one policy is radical and the other policy is less radical. It might be true, but that's beyond besides the point because that's always not the case because it really depends on how you define radical. Like I said before, right? Uh, I, would, I, would, I would argue that sending your country to war is probably the most radical political action anyone can do. Nonetheless, we accept that. We accept that our country must go to war with, in the Middle East, must go to war, you know, um, against any foreign enemy that has in, to preempt a possible attack, right? We think that that is acceptable and that is not radical. And perhaps having the opposite view uh, demonstrating uh, against, uh, against war uh, in, on the streets, that is construed as radical, right? So this is, this is my point. The point is not that the policy are different, are radically different. It is what is constructed, and how and what are the entry points? And the entry points uh, has to do with this idea of visual culture and what the term radical looks like. The term radical looks like like someone more like the Greens, like that, like someone um, that looks like uh, um, a member from, uh, from Labour, right? That is it, it, It's a question of entry points, right? Um, so going to, and, and that's why I think film is really important. When I'm looking at film, again, I'm not looking at film from the point of view of film studies. I'm looking at a film as, as from, from, the, from the viewpoint of political and, visual, and cultural discourses. In this case, audiovisual discourses. 
Uh, so I'm thinking, how are certain ideas in politics constructed and made available, made ready, uh, uh, made readily available uh, to create a political discourse in which you don't question its commonsensicality, so to speak, right? You don't question the commons, the, the, you don't question the ideas within that discourse, you accept them very readily. Uh, in that way, this, this film, especially trans, I'm looking at transnational film, and when I'm thinking about transnational films, I'm thinking about films that could be shown around the globe that it speaks with a cinematic language that is available for everyone, that it speaks with visual, um, with a visual language that, that the mainstream public can easily understand and don't have to question, right? That is not, um, that is not contingent, that is not context bound. Uh, and again, here, the most simple example uh, and the most true example, really, it's superhero movies, Marvel action movies, right? That is big. That's a transnational filmic language. So think about how good and evil are visualized at a global level, right? Think about the heroes and the villains and how a lot of political discourses use that same juxtaposition, the, the global good versus the global evil, pro-democracy, anti-democracy, the dictatorship versus the Democrat, right? Um, and how when we label a certain political event uh, under the, that, um, filmic, oh, we, 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 we use that filmic language to label a political event, to frame a political event. We tend to, uh, when I say we, I mean, we in the political sphere. Yeah. Um, the politi in the political sphere, then the, the, the idea that history is repeating itself comes into play because we are used to that type of idea being repeated. We see it not simply in the historical record, but we see it repeated on and on in different elements of our filmic culture, of a transnational filmic culture, right? And in that way, we can construct these courses of common sense that can become completely uncomplicated. And especially when it comes to transnational politics, these uncomplicated commonsensical in quotation marks, uh, these courses allow for a politics of simplicity, a politics of good versus evil. Um, if you think around the rhetoric of all the evils against democracy, you can you can think of any examples, but that type of evil is modeled after the ultimate evil, which is uh, Nazi, na Nazism, right? If you think about the ultimate evil, Nazis and Adolf Hitler, that's the absolute ultimate evil, as spoken by um, uh, audiovisual culture and transnational film. It's a readily available metaphor. And remember, this has nothing to do with the actual evil of uh, Nazi Germany. Um, because again, evil is a moralistic, um, it's a moralistic term. It doesn't tell you much about the historical record. It doesn't tell you much about the political record. Uh, it, but it gives you, it's an entry point to have a model for evil that then can be accessed later down the road. And I'm just gonna play a fabulous scene from Inglorious Bastards, the, 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 the final scene in the film, Inglorious Bastards. And just to reflect a little bit more of, of how the Nazi um, 
icon is used to simply reinforce uh, the, the symbol of evil beyond what Nazi Germany was or was not. So let's play that clip and, and I'll reflect a little bit more, just a tad bit more on this construction of on evil and why that is important uh, to children of men. you are all going to die. Close out! Oh, yeah, and I want you to look deep into the face of the Jew who is going to do it. I know what I want to um, stop here for a second and probably move on later uh, with the with the slides. But you see what she says, Soshana. I'm Soshana, and this is the um, this is the face of Jewish vengeance. Right? So Tarantino turns everything on its head and put uh, Jewish vengeance at the center of Nazi uh, history, right? But more importantly than that, because that's a really clever way. Um, of, of sending a, a very old message, which is uh, the idea of reconstructing history from the point of view of the underdog, which is a very American um, thing to do. It's, 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 a, it's a, late, a late motif of, of, of Hollywood, really, the underdog. Uh, but beyond that, beyond the analysis of the film, what is happening here is that idea of the ultimate evil that can be burned to death, that can be uh, shot multiple times uh, without any regard, without batting an eye, without audiences uh, wincing or, or, being, uh, or being uncomfortable. Because watching this movie, when, when you shot to death Hitler or you, and you burn down uh, all these Nazis, uh, there is not a moment of uncomfortable, uh, there is not a moment of awkwardness. It's not meant you, it's not meant the audience feel uncomfortable. It's rather cathartic within the movie itself. It's the climatic point. And we side with the face of Jewish vengeance. And what I'm saying here is just beyond the actual plot of the movie, what is happening here is we are accepting that evil can be brutally killed. That whatever is labeled as evil can be brutally killed by all means necessary. Think about now Malcolm X and the idea of by any means necessary. Think about the Black Panthers which their position, which far less radical than this, far less radical than, than this. And one could argue that, um, you know, white privilege in the US at that time was certainly evil, that Jim Crow was certainly evil, then uh, slave owners could be painting as absolutely evil. But in real politics, they did not have access to that construction. Because whiteness could be evil, but it's not evil in the way, in the way Nazi Germany is evil, in the way we have others, other evils that are easily available in our political discourse. Because this transnational filmic language 
doesn't speak of that type of whiteness as evil. It could speak about it as contingent, con as, uh, as evil in a contingent way, context-based. That whiteness could be evil in the context of slavery. It could be evil historically, but it could not be evil in a normative way. While Nazi Germany is evil in a normative way and it's authorized in a normative way. And then you can construct that some type of evil and pin it on any other evils to construct any other political discourse. War on terror and the Middle Eastern terrorists being a primary example of that, right? So again here, I'm going beyond the specificity. So I'm not paying attention to the context. I'm paying attention to the entry point, to the icons, to the symbols, to how you can recreate global stories that then visualize histories that are used to create political discourses of the common sense. It's commonsensical that you bomb terrorists, that you kill Nazis, that you burn them to death. It's not commonsensical when you have a demonstration and any type of violence is exercised and you have that represented on a film. You, if, if you look at any film in which people's violence takes place, it's always, always, absolutely always represented as nonsensical, as problematic, as creating a problem for the protagonist. Malcolm X being the prime example. Maybe you have Malcolm X and, and, and Martin Luther King. If you think the representations in film, it's always there at opposite ends. While in fact, in actuality, they both had a lot in common, especially the la the latter, um, the 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 latter Martin Luther King. Right. Anyways, I'm, I I hope this is understood, right? Because I think um, Children of Men it's it's a really interesting example um, of how this transnational filmic language uh, is constructed with the aspiration, the aspiration to speak to the general public. Uh, and this is, again, besides the fact that uh, Children of Men was not very successfully in terms of like ticket selling, uh, but it has that aspiration from the get-go. Uh, and it's a truly transnational product. Think about um, Cuaron, which is a Mexican director, uh, who just finished the director before uh, Children of Men, just finished the director Harry Potter uh, in the prison of Azkaban. Uh, the film is distributed by Universal and it's filmed in the UK with, um, with, with very famous actors, Clive Owen and, and, and uh, escapes um, Julian Moore, Clive Owen and Julian Moore, right? Um, so there is the aspiration of, of, of being a, uh, a global, a truly global, global mainstream product, even though it didn't succeed. But it is really children of men is really interesting because beyond that, um, the beyond the, the the specifics of its transnational essence as a, a cultural artifact, uh, it reflects a visual narrative of how radical social change is constructed and can be reconstructed. And, 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 it, and you, can, you can think that, that the, the film, you can think that the aspirations of the film, it's to establish images of what's truly wrong with the world. What are the most pressing issues that, um, that can affect anyone around the globe? And when you think of borders, uh, there is nothing more global than borders, right? We have borders everywhere. And in fact, we don't even question the, the, the idea of a border or having a border. In the same way, we don't question the idea of the nation state in and of itself, right? Um, and, 
And I repeat again, but because I want to really emphasize this idea of children of men having a transnational mode of narration, uh, a narrative that aims at creating a transnational language of social change. Um, and Chijek, which we will see um, in, in a second again, he particularly likes children of men precisely because it's a reflection of this ideological despair of late capitalism. It's a reflection of a society without history, or to use another term, biopolitics. And biopolitics is a term that was coined by Foucault. And the film uh, is about biopolitics because the basic problem that the film portrays is a society that is written with biopolitics, that it's bent on how to regulate and generate life. That's the point of the film, right? The, 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 the be all and all the film is in, fertil in slash fertility, right? Uh, and, that, and how can that be um, controlled? How can be, that be apprehended? Biopolitics is the politics that uh, deals with the regulation of our biological um, um, space with how our bodies are politically um, engineered in a way. And I'm using here a metaphor basically. How are, and, and the idea of, for instance, um, uh, think about um, childcare policies, right? And it, those, that, that is biopolitics. If you think about childcare policies, if you have a robust childcare policy in a country, that means that people can have babies. If you don't, that is an obstacle to fertility, to having babies, to producing babies. Think about um, any type of uh, medical regulations. Having access to healthcare is a type of biopolitics. Um, but you know, any type of welfare, social welfare, it's also biopolitics because it deals with the well-beings of people, right? And, and in the end, Chichek think that looks at children of men as the ultimate biopolitics, as, as the most important problem in this idea of social change, the most important problem that the film proposes is the idea of giving life, of creating life, of fertility. And there is nothing more biopolitical than that, right? That is at the top, the priority of the political problem that uh, children of men is representing, right? So beyond the, the very interesting um, reflection on CISEC and biopolitics, the, the more general um, goal of the film is to pre present dystopia as a reality. Dystopia is something that is not far ahead in the future, but it's in the present in the film, but in our own present as audiences. And that's why this is the film is so important. And it does it by having this documentary style, um, um, camera angles, by having this handheld camera and this guerrilla style shots in which um, you, uh, the, you, the audience, identify what you're seeing as basically war journal journalism, as something that you could see in the news. Um, you have these long shots that basically mimic the human eye, that follow a character, but that can linger outside the character's view, right? And then um, we become witnesses. We, the audience, become witnesses. And we are, uh, rather than spectators, uh, we have this mm, um, more pan a, a, a panoramic view of what's happening uh, versus simply following the, 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 the narrative arc of the characters. The characters are important, but the background is even more important because actors are inserted in the background and not the other way around. 
the background in this film is really important, right? Um, this dystopian film, this dystopian reality is quite paradox, right? Because as Shaw is saying uh, in one of the articles that was assigned, uh, this sets up an intriguing paradox. As the near future setting of the film and the notion of universal infertility would suggest that children of men belongs within the fantasy genre. And as a sci-fi fantasy film, we expect a different type of image, not an image that is not realistic, that is, has nothing to do with our present, but it has to do uh, with the future, right? And think about futuristic movies. Think about um, Blade Runner, for instance, and um, what Blade Runner would evoke, or Mad Max, uh, those type of dystopian futuristic movies. Uh, our film as such, Star Trek, uh, Star Wars, you know, that type of movies. Uh, it's something that should be alien to the spectator that would not reflect the present. But nevertheless, through highly complex special effects, the film suggests this authenticity of the newsreel, right? It suggests a footage, images that are associated with this embedded journalism in war zone, right? And that's how visually, the film is telling the audience, this is the future, that the, uh, but this is your present. Yeah. Um, and this is a reflection that, um, that is done in a documentary that accompanies the, the film that is called The Possibility of Hope. And also very telling that this film in the extra section has a documentary that goes with it, right? So we're just gonna hear a little bit about that, about how really the real dystopia is our reality, right? And, and how important is that? And the construction of dystopia that the film is doing uh, as an entry point uh, precisely to construct a political discourse of social change. Because uh, think of social change uh, uh, in this film as constructed only within a dystopic reality. Right? We need a dystopic reality for social change to take place. That is basically in a nutshell what the, one of the big ideas of the film. For me, Children of Men, it's a realist film, but in what sense? Hegel, in his aesthetics, says somewhere that a good portrait looks more like the person who is portrayed than the person itself. Like a good portrait is more you than you are yourself. And I think this is what the film does with our reality. The changes that it introduces do not point towards alternate reality. It simply makes reality the more what it already is. It makes us perceive our own reality as an alternate reality. Like we already live in alternate reality in the sense of we didn't do it properly. Now we still live in alternate reality within properly uh, the history, what he ends up saying, that history went the wrong way and a right, a, 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 the right history should have been uh, not the dystopian, the seemingly dystopian system that we inhabit currently, right? And that, and that children men mirrors. Um, so that is like I would like I um, I I already uh, advanced um, just a minute ago. That is one of the politics the transnational politics of children and men, the idea that social change comes about only within these dystopian parameters, that our reality is truly dystopian, that we are mirroring, uh, that, that children and men is mirroring our reality and is not really about the future, but about the present, that dystopia is 
are real, are, uh, are, are, that the dystopia is not the future, but the present, right? And, it, and then there is a second layer to this, because that is social change has, takes place only within this topic um, conditions. Uh, um, and, you know, um, which, again, I don't, I don't want you to be confused with the idea that, um, that our present reality is or not this topic. Uh, and because that depends on how you look at it. It's both things, um, or it's none of those things. It is the representation and the acceptance that we have when we see this film is not as strange as an audience. It's not meant to make us feel alienated from the film when we see images that remind that of multiple historical events, whether that be the Holocaust, uh, um, immigration policies, uh, Abu Ghraib, um, Guantanamo. There is there is that a million reference in the film that has to do with political moments uh, that are iconic, uh, that are as iconic as they're dystopic. So it's not saying that um, that is not a commentary on our present being or not being this topic. Well, the, the point here is that we did that this topic view of the present, social change can be, is inserted. And the idea is that you couldn't have a non dystopic um, conditions uh, and have social change. That social change cannot happen when uh, we have politics that are just simply full, flaw, that we don't agree with. That social change has to do with truly dystopic conditions. That unless you present that, or you understand the world as truly dystopic, you won't, um, you won't be moved to action. That is the politics of children of men, one of the politics of children of men. Dystopia has to come for you to be moved to action. Otherwise, you can stomach it, right? That is one of the interpretations, possible interpretations of what the film is saying. But there's another layer to this, which has to do with transnational politics, especially cosmopolitanism, right? And, and here the idea is that transnational politics, that trans, and, trans, and transnational politics imply a world in which borders do not exist, in which people and goods can move without borders, without interferences, that transnational politics. And, and, the, and the face of the ideological, um, the, the ideological uh, entry point of those politics uh, is cosmo cosmopolitanism, right? And, and children of men is telling you that. It's, tell, it's telling you that really the problem here is not, it's not only that the nation tends to become a repressive machine, machine is that there are, uh, there are borders drawn that are inherently violent, that if we get rid of those borders, the problem would disappear. And not only we have national borders, but we have borders within borders. We have the green zone uh, in which the, basically the rich uh, British citizens live, and we have the red zones where the refugees are placed, the ghettos, right? And, and, and the, the ultimate uh, symbol of the, the absurdity of these borders has to do with, uh, with it, it's, it's exemplified by the scene in which uh, Theo goes to see his cousin Nigel in his beautiful home by the tape. And he sees this uh, arc of the arts of this, of this iconic art. I'm gonna play that scene and I'll say, and I'll do a little commentary on it.
By the way, see here in the background, Banksy, uh, Banksy um, um, graffiti there, anti-establishment graffiti. And I'll say a little bit more about that. I'm afraid this is a non-smoking facility. You've got something in your teeth. If you'll excuse me. Couldn't save La Pieta. Smashed up before we got there. It's pretty rummy, huh? My mum had a plastic one in the bathroom. It was a lamp. Good to see you there. We've got to keep Las Meninas and a few other Velasquez. But we only got a hold of two Goyas. That thing in Madrid was a real blow to us. Not to mention people. How's Martha? She's doing her animal charity thing. Sends her love. Give him a vest? Yes. See, the point of this art is that art to be this iconic art, this historical art, to have meaning, to be meaningful, it needs context. If you extract it, and I'm using here the word consciously, extracted from his context, it just become another item. It is not dissimilar from the plastic lamp, uh, like a, la, la, the plastic lamp that Theo is talking about, uh, that her mom had, that was like, uh, like the David, like the statue of Michelan, uh, Michelangelo's David. Um, it, it, it simply doesn't, it, it loses its meaning. It loses its value because the value of this type of art uh, resides precisely in, in this context, in the historical context. And when you privatize it, when you put it in this constricted border, it becomes meaningless. It's absurd that you're, having dinner by the Guernica. It's ironic, right? What is meant to be, it, that's the reaction that we have. Uh, what a trip having the David in your living room, right? What a trip having the Guernica, having Banksy uh, painting, uh, right? It's absurd. So in that, what is that signaling is that that extreme border within the border, because it's not like just Theo going to Nigel's um, Hat home that is in the green zone, a border within the border that it's in a much uh, uh, a bigger border that is the UK. Uh, now that living room, it's a border within the border. It, uh, the absurdity that that evokes is the absurdity that children of men wants to construct around the deal border and the opposite, which is cosmopolitanism, right? This transnational politics of the cosmopolitan, of the lack of border, because the opposite would be this um, border should be non-existent. Everyone should, should have access to uh, everywhere, right? Um, and people should move freely and things should be shared collectively. If you push the argument to, uh, to, uh, to, to the ultimate consequences. Right? So that is what the film is saying. It's talking about this in, uh, inclusive universalism. If you push the argument to its limits, uh, the problem, if borders 
and the borders within borders and the absurdity of borders within borders is on one side. On the other side is Theo and Key. And Theo and Key are the future, right? And Theo and Key are the future relative to, to the past. And, and in this case, not to the present, to the past. Because Theo and Key are the future in the sense that the fishes are a, a utopian revolutionary past right, like guerrilla movements. Uh, and the UK government and the borders that the U UK government has, um, has raised uh, in the nation, but also within its nation, is the other side, right? And the third way is Theo and Key. And they, they represent the, the, this cosmopolitan future in which People do not see where people are from. They represent this cosmopolitan utopia in which your, um, your origins do not define you, right? It's inclusive universalism. This idea that we belong to the human race, then the human, hence the human project. We only see human. We don't see races. We don't see class. We only see human. That is the ultimate um, message that children of men is creating and constructing. In between that utopian revolutionary projects of the 70s, of the 80s, uh, of the socialist guerrillas, the revolutionary guerrillas like Che Guevara, and the despotic capitalism of the 90s, 2000, of the GFC, you have that third way which is inclusive universalism. Cosmopolitan people that only see people as humans, right? Um, and this, um, the problem that I have with this inclusive universalism of the critique that can be made of this inclusive universalism is that it's completely unaware of embedded and structural inequalities. And it is unaware of embedded structural inequalities because it does not have a theory of power, right? And the human project is the best example of that, right? Uh, if you think about the last scene in which Theo dies, he names her baby Dylan after Theo's, uh, dead Theo's and, um, uh, Theo's dead baby, right? And then she uh, gets picked up by the tomorrow and the him and the, the boat the human projects um, ship. Um, what you see here is and 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 the and remember that uh, the red zone, uh, the ghetto with all the refugees were conscripted, is bombed by the UK government, so that doesn't exist anymore. So that is gone. Uh, the future is here implied is the human project, this new cosmopolitan beginning. However, think about Key and how she's been constructed throughout the film. Film is being constructed as a victim. She doesn't really have a say. Uh, she's always been saved by, by white men. And, and think that, mm, that Julian, the character of Julian Moore, she's killed. Right? She, so she kind of saved her. And it's Lucas and the rest who are mostly white who's going to save her. But in the end, it's Theo, the one who's going to save her, which is, is the main savior here. And the main savior is Theo, because we know that the fishes are not really going to save her, are going to use her, you see? Um, and Theo will save her because Theo sees her as a human. Then the human project, if you look at that final scene, they are all basically white men uh, who will save this black uh, victim, right? Um, and at the end, when the when the when the scene finishes and uh, and the and and the film goes black, is it you hear the laughing of children, right? And, and the, implying that the future belongs to the children. The problem with this 
sort of naive approach is that it really avoids thinking of children as future men. Uh, and, and the image of this pure project of the human project and thinking of children as a solution of the future, uh, it avoids a theory of power uh, because power, as Foucault already theorized, uh, never dissolves. Power is embedded in all of our interactions. And you cannot just do away with power, even when you want to stay neutral. Staying neutral is a, it's a, it's a signal of power. It's a signal uh, that you have the privilege of staying neutral, of not having to pick a side. You can do that. You have that privilege. Uh, uh, um, and that is a power dynamic, right? So children of men doesn't have a fear of power, right? And especially it ignores the dystopian power, this type of dystopian power uh, that the most important part here uh, of this dystopian power uh, is that the dystopian power that remember is our present, right? That has to do with basically wild, wild capitalism or neoliberalism, right? Untamed capitalism. The most important feature of this uh, system is that it makes its power and brutality invisible, illegible, 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 sorry, illegible. You cannot read it, right? Legible is something that can be read, that can be seen. Illegible is something that cannot be read, that cannot be seen. And you cannot fight when you can see, right? So I'm going to play a little clip from the documentary, Possibility of Hope, that gets into this idea of how really power is not that it disappears, it just it's made invisible and that's how it's effective. That's how power within this dystopic system of um, capitalist brutalities, right? Uh, that's how this type of power can be effective, right? Full stage. When people say 1990 was the time of the end of utopias, 1990 fiasco of communist regimes, also of welfare state, symbolized with fall of the Berlin Wall. But the true utopia was the idea, the end of history. Now, okay, there may be some dictators here and there, but we have the formula. Global liberal capitalism with democracy. In the capitalistic system, economical inequality is acceptable. It's the engine of production. So, the political organizations and the state have to guarantee this inequality because theoretically, inequality brings richness. The fact of the corruptions and the abuses of power that are all legal. Those are our contemporary brutalities. The problem is that so many of these brutalities of global capitalism are not immediately legible. You need to make the connections between that which appears unconnected and to show the extent to which suffering here is a product of what we admire and consider prosperous and desirable there. And so today too, I think, you see it happening in bits and pieces, that a recognition that this global capitalism needs to be civilized. We need to tame, you know, as the taming of a wild animal, that wild capitalism. It doesn't have the ability to think rationally, this economic model. It thinks like a drug addict. Where can I get my next fix? It doesn't learn wisely <laughs> you know if we think of you know any kind of measure of natural wisdom would be you make a mistake you correct it the next time around but a drug addict feels terrible and then says i want more <laughs> and unfortunately we have an economic model that thinks like a crack so, so here's the here's the important part in children of men that dystopian reality that is our present it's simply made invisible in our present. It's not as visible as Quaron uh, purports, purports it to be in the children. You, it's not as visible as that evil, that constructed evil uh, of, the, of the guards in the bus, uh, chastising the refugees, spinning on the, in their faces, like, like the evil of Nazi Germany is precisely because it is invisible, it's illegible, you cannot really read it, that that dystopian reality of our current uh, 
political and economic system can exist because it makes an irrational model, for instance, endless extraction, extraction of natural resources, the only rational course of action, right? And it is spoken with uh, this cinematic language of the common sense, of the common sense that not until the common sense that tells you, not until you see a truly dystopic scenario like children of men, not until then you won't have social change. So if you don't see it, like we don't really see in our everyday lives, in most everyday in, in here in in a, in a lot of countries, um, in the in in the most advanced uh, uh, economies in the world, if you don't see that dystopian scenario right in your face, if you don't see that face of evil, that entry point to understand evil, then social change is still not necessary, right? And the solution, like I said before, is that cosmopolitan universalism. Um, that is, sorry, that's cosmopolitan, trans, uh, transnational politics of, of, of cosmopolitanism, the, um, the uh, in, inclusive universalism. The solution is untenable because borders exist everywhere we go and they don't seem to go away or there is no one really advocating for them to go away, right? So, and the solution is completely, uh, is so utopian that it's unreachable, right? And in the end, all this really uh, comes down to the, 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 the idea that an idea that children of men is not really um, tapping into is that our system, the system that we have, is not only that it's invisible in the way it exercises different types of powers, and that's why it's really hard to understand. It's really hard to, it's really hard to combat. It is that it relates to a much deeper problem that has to do with systemic trends that uh, go beyond this dialogue between the victim, the refugee field, um, and the victimizers, right? The fishes, the UK government, the ultimate evil, right? That these systemic trains um, require a different type of thinking. And with this, I will finish because I think it's a perfect segue to our next uh, block in which we will look at the opposite side of revolutionaries, right? We, we will see, um, we will see the entrepreneur, the the, camp, the venture capitalist, uh, and we look at their transnational conception uh, of the system, right? So I, I, I will leave you with uh, Saskia Assassins and her uh, view of this much deeper problem. And I hope you can relate her words to what I've said, and especially to children of men. Size cities. So we are really confronting a much deeper problem than what the language of an immigrant and refugee crisis suggests, you know, which is deep enough, but it just won't help us. I think we need to look at where all these people are coming from. We are dealing with something that is an assemblage of elements where the super rich and the financiers and all of that, they're just one element. So the challenge is not to just get rid. We could shoot down ba, 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 all the super rich. We would not necessarily have solved the problem. And we all know of rich people who have said, I'm making much more money than I ever thought I would. And frankly, I'm not asking for all this money, but it just comes up rather than going that way. It goes up. So we are dealing with systemic uh, trends. Systemic trends are a different kind of uh, enemy from individuals who are corrupt and who are destroying a village or a town. You know, that's a very radical difference. So it seems to me one, one, one lesson that I have learned after really I've been an activist for 30 years is that we're not going to bring finance down. Finance will bring itself down. We just have to work at creating spaces 
the hard work of making spaces in all kinds of different situations, inside institutions, but also in terms of the neighborhoods, you know, very practical and more conceptual or political discourse kind of spaces eh? to, 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 to create narratives that explain, okay, what can we do? Because the system, the big corporations, you know, I, I have discovered after spending a lot of time and energy and seeing people devote 10 years of their lives, we couldn't bring them down, but they do bring themselves down. You know, and so that, that's an important data. So I have gone, I who am global, <laughs> have gone to back to some zone where I say, all neighborhoods, localities, I mean modest places, I'm not interested in the rich, you know, that is not my concern. We should begin to relocalize, whatever we can relocalize, out with all franchises, no Starbucks, but a local person making that. Because the problem with modest neighborhoods is that the little consumption capacity that they have, the money that they spend, leaves the neighborhood. It should recirculate. Now, I see that as not just a little economic intervention, but a political economic step. Out of that can come a politics. I think, I think neighborhoods that are functional neighborhoods should adopt alternative currencies, not for everything they do. But avoid the credit card system, you know, avoid loans, just you can, they can serve as exchanges too. So begin to work at all levels. And I say that also because the majority of people, also in our rich countries, are not having good lives. Too many are unemployed. So I say, whatever the talents, you know, you can either do barter or you can have a local currency through which you exchange. But begin to work at building up a lot of local sub-economies. Now that isn't a solution or a problem, but what it does, it mobilizes people, it mobilizes talents, it may allows people to exit the big corporate, you know, and branches and all of that. So I say that is one issue, but at a very different level, say academics, we have to begin to figure out, you know, there's a hard work of how do we begin to alter this economic system, which is absolutely destructive. But begin to, and, and we academics in our zones, we should really begin to, to think, and rather than simply describe. We have, should understand what are the limits of this system? Where is this going? You know, and a lot of scholars are doing that. So I think that that kind of mobilizing is necessary. And then finally, we need a political system. I do believe that you need, we need concentrated arrangements which can make big decisions representing a lot of people. And, and that means new types of politicians. And I think, frankly, that the soul, so my take on the state, uh, the state is a complex institution. At its best, it's okay. It's never great. It's just okay. But I think we need that kind of intermediation. You know, I'm not one of those who thinks we should do away with states. And certainly your French state does keep the streets going. And you know, unlike the American state, we have 15,000 bridges that we know will fall. We do nothing about it, you know. Your French state at least, you know, fixes the bridges. So I think it's a combination of elements, but one has to occupy the state with a different politics, you know, a politics that just takes it in a different direction. Today's internationalism of our states is too much geared towards corporations and finance. We need a different kind of inter See, and um, with this a finish, and in the end we could all sum up the politics of children of men, the type of politics that children of, uh, of men ad advocate for, this third way um, that we sort of readily accept is borderless world, this cosmopolitan, inclusive universalist, and we are humans. Uh, we don't, I don't see race, I don't see class, uh, I don't see gender, I just see you as a human. That type of politics is a rootless type of politics. It's not rooted. It's floating like very much in the light, like in the last in the last scene in the film, like he and Theo were floating, very much like the hum the human project is on a ship floating. It's a rootless unrooted type of politics. But I would argue, like Saskia Sassen, 
that we need rooted type of politics. We need to create local spaces, different layer, layers of localities from the very local to the very global to the in, to a different type of internationalism, a different type of a state. We cannot do away with the state. We need to rethink the state and beyond, and not even beyond, uh, as opposed to really, I would argue, a human project type of politics. Okay, so with this, I leave you here, the questions for the tutorials. Uh, please have uh, read through them and, and think um, the different answers.